Welcome to the Going Ballistic Podcast. I'm Ryan Kleckner, and we're here with Jason Kleckner. Glad to be back, guys. Sorry I missed everybody last week, but excited to be back here again. All right, we're glad to have you. You're listening to episode number nine. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave feedback for us on iTunes. Uh, that's going to help the podcast succeed and help others find us. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter on Facebook, both under Ryan Kleckner. Today we're talking about Jason's AR-15 project. We're answering some listener questions, uh, maybe get a little bit into reloading, and some current events with some of the changes in the laws. Uh, this podcast is going to be produced every week, and notes about the show are found at the show's website, which is goingballisticpodcast.com forward slash the show's number. So for example, because this is show number nine, you'll find links and extra info about this episode at goingballisticpodcast.com forward slash nine as the number nine. And of course, if you're looking to learn more about long-range shooting, please check out my book. Uh, the Long-Range Shooting Handbook is available on Amazon.com and paperback and Kindle versions, and it's now available on iTunes as well. I've had a few uh, questions uh, this last week, actually, about autographed copies. Yes, I sell them. Uh, they're available through the book's website at longrangeshootinghandbook.com. So if you'd like to order one there, uh, feel free. All copies of the book help support two charities, uh, two great military charities, the Sua Sponte Foundation and the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. And as of last week, we broke 5,000 copies sold. So I really appreciate it, everybody. You guys uh, still uh, continue to uh, make it more popular than I ever expected, and I appreciate it. All right, let's get to the show. So, uh, Jason, uh, last week, we talked a little bit about some of the decisions you were you were making when it came to uh, your lower receiver. So to catch everyone else up, we are going to follow Jason's journey through building his own AR-15. And it's, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say yes, and and I and I lied when we were talking about it. I was excited about going with a forged, and after extensive research and stopping at a couple of machine shops and seeing all the different stuff that's out there, I am now going to go with a custom-made billet no uh, so the conversation we had last time everybody was the differences of course between forge and billet lowers and you can go back and listen to that podcast if you want to hear the discussion and i think i was trying to get jason to lean a little bit more towards a forged lower um maybe because every ar i have is forged but he broke down he went to the dark side he wants a pretty ar-15 uh, now you did ask me about uh some of the materials jason what was that <laughs> I did. So one of the shops that we stopped at, um, they use a 6061 aluminum. And I and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the forged is a 7075. Sounds right to me. So uh, from what I, I read, basically, you know, the 6061 is softer. Um, and as far as tensile strength goes, not quite half, but a little bit above half of what a 7075 is. Right, so 7075 is definitely harder. Whether that's better or not, who knows? Um, I, I, yeah, I used was... to, working on cars, always try to replace the bolts when I'd work on an old car, and I'd take a part off. Before I'd put the part back on, I used to go down to the hardware store and get replacement bolts, so it was like nice brand new hardware. And I always went with grade 8, because I thought, well, grade 8, they're harder, that's got to be better, right? Well, not always. Sometimes soft is good. Sometimes soft means not brittle. You know, sometimes it means forgiving. I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm just trying to remind people that although 7075 is harder, doesn't mean necessarily better. And I believe this goes into the category of if you never knew, you wouldn't have cared anyway. Right? So 6061 versus 7075, I challenge most people to tell me which one their AR is in their closet or their safe right now. They probably don't know. But when they get into reading about it and they get into debates, then, of course, they're going to have to come out as one is much better than the other one. Um, but again, it's we have so much information at our fingertips with the Internet and so much talk going on at gun stores. Uh, if, if you honestly couldn't tell the difference, if I could lie to you, how about that? For those of you out there that think it really, really matters, if I could lie to you and tell you that the AR is selling you is one versus the other and you'd never be able to tell the difference absent taking it to a lab and getting it tested, then it probably doesn't matter. Do you agree? Yeah, and I and I read so much into it, and that's basically it. I mean, there's no 
other than the hard facts of the tensile strength of it, you have people that said exactly what you said. I mean, yeah, the softer is better because if something did happen, it won't crack, it would flex. And I mean, it just goes back and forth, back and forth. Right. And again, if you can't tell the difference, if someone swears that they want 60, 61, and I gave them 70, 75, and they never knew the difference, would they ever know? No. So it can't be that big a deal. But if it matters to you, knock yourself out, get the one you want. So Jason has decided on a local machine shop uh, that he's still talking with to work out some of the details uh, that makes a billet upper and lower. And you kind of went over that direction solely based on looks, right? Yeah. uh, Some of the features were just, they were just awesome. They were pretty. Um, The (laughs) anodization colors are limitless. Um, I really liked, and I know we haven't got into uppers yet, but I, I liked a lot of the things he could do with the upper, and I will get into that when we cover that part of it. Um, well, the anodized, low- to be fair, that's just a, what they're doing to aluminum. It doesn't matter the shape of the aluminum. This particular shop just happens to offer different colors for anodizing, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I get it. I get it. Some of the billet lowers are pretty. I mean, some of the angles they make, some of the... Uh, some of the lines uh, look really nice. I mean, so there's something that, that always bothers me uh, on forged. I shouldn't say always. Often bothers me on forged lowers. Is there, when you look at a forged lower, on the left-hand side uh, of the magazine well, there is a, I don't know, half inch, five-eighths of an inch wide raised bump that runs vertically from the bottom of the mag well to the top. And what that allows for is that little bump out on the magazine. That is the little stop. So the bottom of the, where the magazine catch interacts with the magazine sticks out of the magazine a little bit. And that's a little raceway or a little track for that piece to slide up and down. Well, instead of just abruptly having that uh, special track stop at the magazine catch, they continue it all the way to the top. And I don't know if that's uh, instead of having an abrupt stop or just because they broach it. And I think we talked last time that you know, broaching is just the big uh, kind of like a cheese grater chisel going through the aluminum so it cuts that raceway instead of having that then at least stop to the upper they extend that raceway or that little bump up into the upper for about three-eighths of an inch and then let it gradually kind of taper back in so it kind of looks pretty does that make sense so that, Mm -hmm. that, that stripe continues on but almost every not all but almost every single upper lower combination i've seen those bumps are not lined up I'm thinking if you, the only reason that bump is on the upper for that three eighths of an inch is purely cosmetic so that that raised section of the lower doesn't have that abrupt stop where it meets the upper. It's solely cosmetic. It serves no purpose on the gun whatsoever and they can't even line it up. And it's because they're buying it from two different companies that have, I guess, two different specs. And it it doesn't matter the functioning of the gun. It doesn't, it, it really, all it is is truly a cosmetic problem. But it always bothered me so much because they're making the gun look ugly because of something that's there only to make the gun look good. So if you're listening to me out there, manufacturers, come on. We notice this kind of thing. (laughs) Take your time and get those (laughs) things lined up. That's all it does. So now with your set, you're not going to have that problem. You're going to have some beautifully matched, lined up, cool lines and angles in the upper and lower, right? Yeah, and and I will talk with him and see if I can get some actual pictures that we can throw up of the actual solid block, how it starts. Um, instead of the broaching, they do EDM. They have an EDM machine, so everything's cut out, you know, for the bag perfect. <laughs> it's for it's every- a beautiful shop that this guy has. They for- do aerospace parts, and they do tactical parts on the side. I bet they do aerospace parts, so they're doing wire EDMing. Uh, so for everyone listening, EDM, Jason, help me on this one, is electronic discharge machining? I, I don't know what I it bl- is. I believe that's right. Basically what it is, it's a thin wire that runs like a bandsaw. And an electrical charge comes through it and allows it to cut at the super hot temperature while it's engulfed in water. And it's the closest you can get to cutting a inside 90 degree corner. Because milling, as you know, everything's radius. Same thing with EDM wire. But it's you, you just can't cut a inside square shape. It just doesn't happen. And what's that EDM wire made out of? You know, I don't know, but I have a couple machine buddies that do aerospace parts, and I can get that information for you. It's it, gold. To me, it looks like welding copper wire. It's gold. Is it really? It's gold wire. So a wire EDM machine, when that gold wire comes out the other end, they have to pile it up and send it back to the company so it can be reclaimed, remelted down and everything. I mean, it may not be pure, but it's effectively gold wire. 
that's why it holds the charge so well because that that water solution is really a you know solution of you know chemicals so it holds the the charge a little better it's not just pure water yeah it's gold wire so you're, you're literally cutting with gold wire at a high speed like that bandsaw and you're right it's extremely precise but it's also extremely slow you know broaching even a slow broach to go through the lower i can't imagine taking longer than 10 seconds by the time it goes through, maybe a full 30 seconds if they're going to worry about loading it and unloading it from the fixture. Where I bet to cut that out of a wire EDM would probably take 45 minutes or an hour for it to go around. It's, it's, it's a pretty slow process. You know, so it's great. You're going to get an extremely, extremely precise cut magwell. And for some people, that really matters. I've, I've heard this discussion, too, about why they like a certain company's forged lower. So this isn't a propri- you know, property of a milled lower. But some companies will wire EDM their their magwell. Well, I don't even know if I've had an AR with a wire EDM magwell. I think every AR I've ever shot has been broached. And never once have I had a problem with the dimensions of my magwell, you know, being too precise or not. But I think that's awesome. You're going to have an extremely, uh, if, it, if it can be such a thing, sexy lower, knowing that it's that much care and attention has been put to every dimension. That's That's really cool. I'm excited for you. Well, and, and the pricing is really good. I mean, I'll, I'll give you all that once that happens. But, I mean, it, it wasn't too much more than buying a Forge one. Uh, he's going to do some custom engraving on it for me. Um, so, yeah. Ooh, let's talk engraving. Are you going to be getting a custom serial number? He brought that up. He said, we can do that if you want. He said, it, it'll take a lot longer to get it. Uh, he said, there's a little more paperwork involved in doing such a thing. But he said, it's... It's a possibility if you want one. I said, no, I'm not too concerned about the custom serial number, but some engravings that I'd like to have on the Magwell part is yeah. awesome. He said he could move the serial number and stuff to different, a little bit off to the side to put other engravings if I wanted. Yeah, if you're already going to so, have it in the fixture getting engraved before it gets anodized, you might as well, right? Because for those of you that want to buy a lower first and then have it engraved, well, you're going to be engraving through the anodizing. And you may not care. It just may be a silver logo for you. And honestly, in the big scheme of things, it's probably not going to matter at all if you just left it silver. But the aluminum will oxidize there. And technically, the aluminum is weaker when the anodizing has been removed. So anodizing, guys, is not just a way to color the aluminum. It actually strengthens the aluminum. So for those of you that are making the quote-unquote 80% you know, receivers yourself and you're leaving it raw aluminum, um, not only will it oxidize slightly, but it's also weaker. It doesn't have that hard... Uh, for lack of a better phrase, candy-coated shell that the anodizing puts onto the aluminum for you. So keep that in mind. Uh, all right, so for the... Do you have choices over the safe and fire markings? I believe so. I mean, sky's the limit for whatever I want to do because it's just a block of aluminum. So you, can do like, do... you can do pictures. You can put like an X, a thumbs down, and a thumbs up. You can put whatever you want for safe and fire, right? Yep. All right, I think someone out there might do it. I swear I've seen a picture of it, but I've I've told Jason that if I was in his shoes, without a doubt, I wouldn't even hesitate. I would have the safety say no pew, spelled P-E-W. I would have the semi-auto position say pew, and then I'd have the full auto position say pew, 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 <laughs> a bunch of times on it, because that I would just laugh every time I saw it. Uh now, for those of you that are wondering, you don't have to actually have it be a full auto lower to have those markings on there. You're allowed to put, within reason, whatever markings you want on a lower. I know I say within reason because you can't just cover the lower with a bunch of numbers or else you know, the ATF would never know which one was the serial number. You can't do things like that. But as long as the markings aren't confusing the ATF on who the manufacturer was or who the, what the serial number is or what the model is or things like that, you can have fun with logos and phrases and things like that on there. Uh, also, if you end up converting your AR-15 to an SBR or, um, yeah, I guess that's the only one you'd be doing on your own. If you convert it to an SBR, you're going to have to mark it also. So you're either going to have to mark it with your name or you're going to have to mark it with the name of your trust if you're doing it under a trust. So keep that in mind, too, on whatever name you give for your trust. It's going to have to be marked on there, and you can't have that marking be confused or hidden among your other markings but other than that that's awesome man i'm excited for you we can't wait to hear uh who you end up going with what markings you end up getting on there and of course what color i mean if you're worried about the looks might as well talk about the color yeah and and i'm they had one on display there that i i wouldn't say it was beautiful but i thought it was neat is they had two different colors an upper and a lower of like a light brown and a dark brown they had one 
that was real flashy that isn't me you know it was like a light gold and a dark gold but the two-tone um i really liked it nice now are you gonna we can talk about it later when we get to finishes when we start to get towards the end of your project but you know you can Cerakote, Duracote, gun coat there's all these other you know products out there that you can use to effectively paint your ar now, if you anodize it a certain color you're not going to want to coat over that are you no, and they also have a place that they send out for the Cerakoting, and they had two of them there for me to look at. And it's not that it wasn't nice looking, but it, um, to me, it did not have the appeal of the anodized at all. Yeah, anodized has a little bit of a metallic-y sparkle to it sometimes. Uh, it's it's a cool. It's cool. Yeah, I've even seen clear anodizing, which is pretty neat too. Um, the problem with Cerakote, some of these other coatings. Now I say the problem. After saying I love it, I I have a few firearms Cerakoted. I think it's I think it's awesome. And out of all the coatings, Cerakote's my favorite. However, it's still a paint. I mean, no matter how much the marketing you know, talks about all the cool properties of it, it's still a paint. And some of the Cerakote paint gets baked on, some of it just air dries, depending on which formulation you have. And it will wear, and it will scratch off, and it will go away. So be careful. That anodizing that Jason is getting is probably going to last a lot longer as far as uh, being a solid color and not getting all dinged up, uh, then Cerakote will. But you can do some pretty cool paint jobs with Cerakote. So just keep that in mind, everybody. Yeah, and the Cerakote, I tell you, it really reminded me of powder coating uh, when, I, when I looked at it and touched it. Yeah, I, I think powder coating, I'm, I'm making this up, but I think powder coating is a little stronger. Yeah, powder coating is also a little thicker, you know, a little right. harder to apply, where Cerakote is a little easier. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a highly bonding paint. That's really strong. You know, a lot of silencers are in Cerakote, you know, ironically, the, the air dry Cerakote does better with heat than the bake on Cerakote. So silencers are very often spray painted in air dry Cerakote, which isn't in as many colors, but it handles the heat a lot better of the silencers without discoloring. Whereas a lot of the, uh, custom paint jobs you see on the guns on the slides and receivers they don't get tons of heat like a silencer does they do the bake on cerakote yeah it's it's cool stuff again i like it just uh don't get your hopes up that it's going to last forever because eventually it'll start scratching especially if you do something like a pistol slide and you're drawing your pistol a bunch you're going to get it to wear off probably faster than the factory finish and you know just don't be discouraged when that happens now, the other thing that I learned in this whole process, because I was going to go with the forged, um, and, you know, we are trying to keep this within a budget thing. The fact that it's 6061 reduced the price of it dramatically from the 7075 bill of ones. Really? Is that because it's easier to machine? I'm assuming so. Well, ask them, because I'm curious. I mean, the aluminum might be cheaper itself. You know, the actual billet, the block of aluminum might be cheaper. But I'd imagine softer is easier to machine, so that, that might be, you know, just time and, and um, bits and hardware, you know? Who knows? Yeah, no, I'll ask him for sure and find out. But, I mean, to give you an example, I think for the lower and the upper, we're looking at, and I don't know what the total will be, but it's going to be about 260 bucks. Whereas, for I mean, both I together, some lowers that were like $300. Holy cow, that, that is inexpensive for milled upper and lower. Well, hey, get this guy to be a supporter. We can we can start sending people to him. Sounds good. All right. So the the next thing we need to start talking about will be lower parts kits. Now, you can buy you know, mil-spec lower parts kits all together in one bag. That's probably your most economical solution. And for most of y'all out there, that's what I recommend doing. If you can find a bag that has all the parts together, you can get them um, from Strike Industries. You can get them from Palmetto State Armory. You can get them from these other places. Do it because although you might end up replacing some of the parts later, at least you'll have a working AR-15, and then you'll know how to put every part in. So when you do an upgrade later, you, you can. So if you want a nicer trigger, great. You can buy these lower, lower parts kits without the trigger or get one with the trigger in it and just have fun with the gun for a while. And when you go to upgrade the trigger, you take the original one out and you got a backup. At least you know how it works. So we'll get there a little more once Jason gets his lower because we can't get too ahead of ourselves on how to build it. Um, hopefully he'll get them soon so we can get into not only what the we should look for in the parts kits, 
uh, what the costs are, but also some of the tools you need to start getting. Uh, so for those of you that want to um, start building your own, you're going to need at least some sort of mallet. I mean, a nice nylon mallet would be nice so you don't mar your gun when you when you miss, you know, knocking a pin in. Um, most of your grip screws will be flathead. Sometimes they're Allen head now, so a good set of Allen wrenches. And what we'll talk about more when we talk about how to assemble the lower is special roll pin punches. So if you just use your regular punches you have in your garage, you're very likely to mar your roll pins or worse, mar the, the receiver itself. So we can talk about those some more. Um, in Jason's search, he ended up looking at the Palmetto State guns, I believe we mentioned on the podcast, and there were a bunch of options, and then there weren't. And <laughs> they're all sold out, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fast. I mean, I looked one night, and I was like, oh, these are great deals, man. I, the, mm-hmm. You can't beat this. This is this is fantastic. It comes with a stock. It comes with all kinds of stuff. And the prices were great. And then I went back a couple of days later, and bam, they're all out of stock. And I, So, of course, that was because of us. But... <laughs> I told Jason that uh, uh, if he did get one of those, I was threatening to make him send it to me so I could disassemble it before he got it. Because that's like buying a puzzle that's already assembled because I already put it together for you. So uh, either way, it'll be fun to go through all the parts. So next podcast, regardless of where you're at, Jason, we'll cover the lower parts kits and some considerations and actually even how to start building it. You know, how to start putting it together so people can start working on their own builds if they want. And we can get some good pictures of that. Sound good? No, that sounds great. Because, like I said, I'm gonna tomorrow. I'm gonna stop. Everything will be ordered and paid for. Um, I'm guessing a two week lead time. He can machine everything within a day, but he said it kind of varies because they send it out to be anodized. So it's just a matter of how long it takes to get gotcha. there for them to do it and come back. Right, right. Okay. Uh, so, well, some current events for everybody. I promised I'd sneak these in every once in a while. Uh, these will mostly matter for FFLs, but it, it could affect you as well. The State Department came out with some official guidance on who needs to register with the DDTC. So export controls uh, for a crash course, I'll try to keep it not, not boring or not as boring as possible. Export controls in our country are regulated mostly by two agencies, right? So we have the State Department on one side and Commerce Department on the other. State Department deals with mostly military scary stuff. So tanks, rocket launchers, uh, satellite hardware, rifles and handguns, and short-barreled shotguns. Now, sporting shotguns, which have barrels over 18 inches in length, are actually regulated by commerce. And commerce regulates everything else in our world, like toilet paper. So it's like a a regular consumer good. Well, under ITAR, the group in ITAR, I mean, not ITAR, under the State Department, the group that uh, helps regulate all these things in our industry, is the DDTC. That's the Director of Defense Trade Controls. Really fancy title. And they oversee and help help enforce ITAR, which is the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. You guys will see ITAR and DDTC more now that you've heard it. You know, go to Magpul's website and go look at the bottom of one of their products, Ron Brownells or Midway USA, and you'll see for certain, especially military, quote-unquote, grade products, you'll see DDTC ITAR warnings at the bottom of the webpage. This is what they're talking about is you can't export you know, these items without an export license. So they're warning you when you buy that grip, for example, from Magpul, that, hey, you can buy this, you can use it, but don't go ship it to your buddy outside the country. Well, they also require manufacturers, so a special type of FFLs, manufacturers, like Jason's dealing with right now, to register with DDTC. And, I mean, it's a few thousand dollars a year uh, to pay this registration fee even if you never intended to export. So if that's a shock to you and you're a manufacturer and you've never heard of this before, uh, get a hold of me. I'll help you. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's what I do for a living. Um, you'd be surprised how almost every small manufacturer I've encountered didn't know they have to register and you can get in trouble with the State Department. Well, that's what kept a lot of people from getting a manufacturing FFL. So if you're thinking about getting your own FFL because you thought it'd be fun to build some ARs on your own, um, and you end up getting a manufacturing one, most people were scared that they'd have to pay this extra, it's not quite 3000 but rounding up $3,000 fee every single year, even though they're never exporting. Well, I've long advised, uh, with guidance from State Department, that if you're just assembling parts, so if you're not doing what this guy that Jason's dealing with is doing, if you're not actually machining anything, if you're just assembling already machined parts, you didn't have to register. That saved you a lot of money. Well. DDTC's guidance that just came out 
now is going to affect the gunsmiths. So everybody listen up. If you're a gunsmith, your friend's a gunsmith, make sure people know this guidance is out there. They've gone so far to essentially say that if you are machining and not just replacing a simple part, if you're machining, you might have to register. So they said some exemptions are like if you tap and rethread a hole you know, for a scope base, that's still gunsmithing. But if you are you know, cutting out a certain uh, part on the gun to make it fit better, if you're chambering a barrel to put it onto a receiver, if you're doing things like that, uh, even if you thought you were just a gunsmith, heads up, again, contact me. I'm more than happy to help. But there's the biggest current event change is the State Department now says you have to register. That's a, that's a lot of money, so be careful. Uh, now, how does... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I say, now, how does that work? You said ship out of the country. Is that strictly lower 48? Or is that... Uh, good question. I When I say out of the country, I just mean outside the United States. So you can still ship to Alaska and Hawaii. Um. That goes even further for a discussion that would bore you guys even more about what can't be exported. Like there's something called technical data. So technical data. So you can't ship out guns. You can't ship out gun parts or accessories that actually will increase the utility of the firearm. But you also can't export technical data, which is any information that could help somebody make a gun or use a gun that isn't publicly available. So you have a special way of chambering your, your barrels that you really like, and you put a YouTube video up of it. You just unlawfully exported that technical data because that information got exported once it got on the internet. An export isn't tested by whether it leaves the country. An export is tested by whether a foreign person receives it. So you could export something in your house in America by sharing technical data with a foreign person. So, as you can imagine, this gets really uh, weird when it comes to training scenarios or foreign visitors from you know, manufacturing plants or things like that. People need to be very careful of this stuff because they tend to always think ATF. They tend to forget about these kind of things. So, just be careful, everybody, when it comes to shipping something to somebody in a foreign country that's a sling or a scope or a gun part or things like that. And likewise, be careful when you're bringing it in. You know, you, you look up a gun part online that you really like and you order it from the manufacturer, make sure that it's not a Canadian company and you're unlawfully now importing gun parts and you didn't even realize what you're doing. So be careful with this stuff. It's no joke. Um, enough about that. So some of the questions that folks uh, wrote in, this was an extremely busy week. Um, maybe it's because it's been so long they've heard from Jason. They just wanted to get in and hear what was going on. <laughs> but uh, I bet I had 15 emails this week from people randomly writing in. To me, that's a lot. So thank you, everyone, for writing in. Uh, Eli, who we mentioned last podcast, actually has a couple more questions uh, for me. He said he asked for Class 3 items, which uh, is, is not really a thing for everybody. There's no such thing as a, as a Class 3 item. I know everyone uses that term a lot, but it does, it's, it's the inaccurate term. Class 3 refers to the type of SOT that an FFL is. Uh, it has nothing to do with the item. Um, I already know I've been geeky enough, so I'll stop here. If you guys really want to hear the discussion or the distinction on that, I'll get into it some more. But he wanted to know, when you have something like a silencer and a trust and you move states, what happens? Especially if the state you go to doesn't allow them anymore. Is it a problem? Because technically you don't own the silencer, the trust does. You know, What if your rest of the trust members are staying in the friendly state and you're the only one going to the bad state? What happens? Well, what happens is you don't bring the silencers to the bad state. It does not matter where you're located. As long as you're not possessing them while you um, while you're visiting or while you're out there. Now with under 41F, there's a good chance I can't I can't see it right now in the law that the ATF is going to want you to notify the local law enforcement there. I, I think that's that'd be crazy. But part of these new rules that came out require the local law enforcement to know. So for example, if you lived in New York City and you were on a trust, they'd never approve it in the first place. Because, you know, there'd be a problem with it for you being there. So moving there afterwards is very interesting. What I do want to warn everybody is, is as silencers are getting popular, be careful where you travel. Jason, you're out in Arizona. You have quite a ways to drive to get to the border. You live in the Northeast and you live in Connecticut, for example, where silencers are legal. You can drive a half hour in the wrong direction and be through another state and get yourself in a world of hurt. Uh, silencers, you are not allowed to have across state lines without ATF permission first. 
So if you, so what do you have to do to get that kind of permission? You have to write into the ATF on the form. I'll, I'll put a link to the form on the website if you guys want. But yeah, you want to go on a hunting trip in Texas? You're supposed to write in and get permission before that silencer leaves and goes with you. Now, SBRs, short-barreled rifles, are allowed to go without permission as long as it's temporarily. So if you took a silenced SBR with you on a hog hunt in Texas, you have to get permission before your silencer is allowed to go with you to Texas. But your SBR you're allowed to take is fine as long as it's a temporary trip and you're going back. People get in trouble with that one all the time because how are you supposed to know all these rules? You know, you don't know it all. But yeah, the, the silencer needs to stay in the state where it's, where it's at before it crosses. Not only do you need permission, but you need to make sure that it's going into a friendly state. Uh, do not, I repeat, do not take your silencer into a state where it's banned. You're going to get yourself in a world of hurt. You know, and I fly a lot with firearms. So if you guys fly with firearms, that's great. You know, Jason, you want to fly to New Hampshire with your silencer because you want to go on a hunt and you get permission to move the silencer. Great. Take it on with you. You can check it in your bags. And when you are flying to New Hampshire and the weather's so bad, they divert your flight to New York City. And they tell everyone you got to stay the night in a hotel and the plane will take back off in the morning. You better not get your bags. Because if you take possession of your bags, you are now possessing a silencer, an NFA item, in New York City. You will go to jail. That actually has happened to a guy where the flight was diverted. He went to check back in in the morning. He said, oh, I got a silencer. And they said, what do you mean you have a silencer? This is New York City. And to explain that his flight got diverted and he got arrested on the spot and went to jail. So um, I'm glad silencers are getting more and more popular. I'm glad everyone's getting them. Um, but you need to know the rules. And, and, uh, and the more I think about it, the more I need to maybe just put a list of these quick rules together for people because it's kind of hard to find them. Now, if you move to a friendly state, everything's good. You just have to notify the local police or no? Nope. You have to get permission from the ATF before you go. And that's it. And that's it. Yeah. Now, the issue with the trust is what makes it weird. The way the law is written, it doesn't require it. Um, but the new rules require everybody on the trust notifying their local law enforcement that they're in possession. They're going to be in possession of a silencer or they have the ability to possess a silencer because of the trust. So it, it naturally follows that the ATF might try to make you tell the local law enforcement once you get there, since the whole point is they want you know local law enforcement to know. Um, but no, do not just get in the truck and move without getting that permission first. That's really easy to get lose track of and uh, and get in trouble with. So be careful. Now, how long does something like that take? Now, with everything backed up, I have no idea. It used to take three weeks. I, I can't imagine it taking more than a couple months now. But it's it's plan ahead time. You can't just take it and go. You just can't do it the day before you're moving. <laughs> Well, yeah, you might actually have to leave it behind. You might have to put it in a safe deposit box. Or if you have a trust, put it in the possession of somebody else who's on the trust who's allowed to possess it and wait till it can come to you. But if you leave it in somebody else's possession who's not allowed to have it, you're setting them up for failure because now they're going to get in trouble for unlawfully possessing a silencer. So uh, good luck, guys. There's a lot of rules out there. I get, you know my email. If you don't, go find it on the website, goingballisticpodcast.com. Get a hold of me. Um, maybe I'll get you as a new client. So who knows? All right. The other question <laughs> Eli had, um, he was talking about, uh, he listened to the podcast on first versus second focal plane. And I think he had the same mistake that Jason was having, which was not having the right magnification setting on second focal plane. And therefore the sub tensions, you know, the lines in his reticle weren't lining up what they were supposed to line up. And he asked, how is he supposed to know what the right setting is? Well, I mentioned that some, magnification rings on scopes will have an actual mark like a dot or something that's like on some night force scopes you'll know where the setting is because you have to read your manual sorry your scopes manual is going to tell you where it needs to be um for most of my you know loop old scopes it's just full power so i turn the ring till it stops and i know the settings are right um so there's no way by looking through it to see a certain size or no except for looking at, at the marks. Now, some of the Vortex scopes, too, have some neat marks that allow you to do math. They allow the subtensions to be um, twice as big as they normally are because the image is getting smaller. And so they do the math for you that if you go to this line, you can actually times everything by two. And if you go to this line, you can times it by three. So I think that's kind of cool. They did the magnification math. You just got to remember which line you're at and where you're going to be. So just pay attention. Sorry, Eli. Only answer I have for you on that one. 
Um, another question from Henry. He asked about reloading. Uh, he said he wants to um, not only save some money, but it's getting harder and harder to buy ammunition where he's at in California. And he asked, should he? What kind of reloader should he get? Should he get a progressive or a single stage reloader? Now, Jason, you you don't have much experience reloading, correct? Correct. I do know enough about them from friends and stuff, but no, I'm I'm currently not reloading. So I I, I want to stop calling it reloading. I don't know why it bothers me, but sometimes you do it with new components. So you're not reloading. So maybe hand loading is that a better term for it? Sounds better, Making doesn't it? Bullets. Make, make them bullets. Well, no, you're not making the bullets either, but I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, my my buddy, uh, really good friend of mine, Aaron and I, when we when I lived in Arizona, used to reload together. And although I never recommend drinking and reloading, we may have used it as a time to get together and have a couple of beers and reload. And we jokingly called it uh, Close Enough Reloading Company because, eh, close enough. <laughs> As you're, as you're working along, I had, had, a, had a couple beers and you about worrying about whether something was perfect or not. Um, so his question is, should he get a progressive? Because that'll help him with handgun ammo for not only, you know, for not only, but for speed. So it'll be cheaper because he will do more faster. Or should he get something like a single stage press for accuracy? Well, uh, honestly, I think you should kind of go in the middle if you're going to get one. Um, I'm a big fan for progressive reloaders. I don't think you get better than a Dillon reloader. Um, And for everyone listening, if you don't know, a progressive reloader has multiple stations. So that when you're pulling the handle down on the press, uh, you are doing more than one thing. So, uh, for example, on one stage, you might be resizing the brass, uh, which is getting it back to its pre-fired size. On another stage, you might be adding the powder. On another stage, you might be seating the bullet, or it's you know putting the primer in on, on the first stage. So all these different stages are doing a different step when you pull the handle. And on some progressives, you know, as you put the handle back or as you're pulling the handle up, it automatically indexes, it automatically rotates itself, kind of like a revolver. And on others, you have to manually rotate it. So you have to take your thumb and flip it to the next station. So you turn this head that has all the pieces of brass in it, then all the Everything that's sitting there rotates one station, then you pull it again. Then it rotates one station, you pull it again. But every time you pull the handle and rotate it, a live cartridge will fall out the back of the machine, and it's done. So it's kind of cool. It's called a progressive machine. Well, I've done a lot of loading on a Dillon 650. And again, uh, Dillon's just, uh, without a doubt, I'll tell you guys, don't get a progressive reloader except for a Dillon. That that is so far the way to go. Um, Learn from mine and everybody else's mistakes. Just get the Dillon first. Uh, the Dillon 650 is an automatically indexing reloader, and we'll get into the nuances and deeper reloading topics much more in the future. But for now, uh, you just crank the handle, and with your right hand and with your left hand, you grab a fresh bullet, set it on top of the empty case, crank the handle again. So it's handle, bullet, handle, bullet, handle, bullet. And about that fast, as you're cranking, live cartridges are popping out the back end. So... When you're trying to go as fast as you can, you know, we would race every once in a while. It's very easy to get over a thousand rounds an hour done. Very easy. So you're stuffing primers, you're filling it up with powder. It's actually a lot of fun. You can crank out a lot of ammo. So that's great, especially for pistol. Um, I say especially for pistol, not only because you're not usually so worried about the accuracy, but you don't have to lube the cases. So if you get yourself some good dyes, like some good carbide dyes, again, we'll get into this more in the future. You don't even have to put any lube on the case. You just got to clean them. So we we reloaded a lot of 45 auto. And with 45 brass, you can reload it until you lose it. I mean, you can reload that 10, 12 times easy. So you throw the brass in, you start cranking, you go to town, and you feed them in. They come out the back end. It's nice. Now, rifle brass, you must lube. So you, there's special, you know, mostly wax-based lube. They have to put on these brass cases, so when they go into the resizing die, which is actually forcing the outside of the die, the brass, I'm sorry, back down to its original shape, and there's also an expander ball, so it's like a, a peg hanging down that's floating in the middle of the die with sometimes a football-shaped uh, piece on it, and that's actually diving in and opening the neck of the brass up to the right size, too. So it's kind of opening it and squishing it together at the same time. Uh, I, for one, I'll admit, the first time I put a piece of 223 brass in, I didn't have enough lube on it maybe no lube lifted the handle pulled the handle back down to to lower the machine again and it just yanked the bottom of the brass straight off broke the brass in half the brass was so wedged in the die it just ripped the bottom of the brass off like well that was a brand new die (laughs) my first one i got it stuck in there um 
no guarantees they'll do this every time. But one of the reasons I recommend Dylan is I drove down to Dylan when I was living near Scottsdale. I said, hey, I'm an idiot. Look what I did. And they just tossed me a new die. They did no questions asked. They said, yeah, some people are idiots like that. Here you go. Here's another die. You know, lube it next time. Um, and they can get expensive. So that was pretty cool they did that. So you got to lube them and then you resize them. And then you have these sticky lubed resized cases that you got to go back and re-clean. So you're losing a lot of the benefit of the progressive as you're having to load it, resize it, take it out, put it in another bin. When that bin gets full, then go clean them. And then when they get cleaned and you take them out of the, the, the media, you know, some, most often like a corn cob media, and you're dealing with like 223 brass, you have to sit there with like a paper clip or a dental pick and pop all the corn cob media out of the primer hole. It, it's a pain in the butt sometimes. Now, I do know some of the Dillons that I've used with a couple of my buddies. When it comes to rifle ammo, they don't use the powder measure. They measure each one themselves. Correct. So, so not only does progressive slow you down anyway, because you have you very often have to you know clean after you relube. Um, some reason people don't like the progressives are because of the powder measure. So the powder measure automatically doses a certain amount of powder you know, out into the cartridge based on volume. So it's a little uh, chamber that fills up that you adjust the exact size you want, and then it fills and dumps out that amount of powder. Well, although that's accurate enough for pistol, and honestly, for blinking rifle ammo, that's all I use. I load two two three like crazy on a Dillon, and I use the powder measure, and it's just fine and can be extremely accurate. As a matter of fact, there's a whole school of thought that some people say that the volume of powder is actually more um, important than the exact weight of the powder. Because, you know, the powder, different humidities and stuff like that. So that, that's an interesting thought. But yeah, you can always just take the auto powder measure off and treat your progressive like it was a single stage. So that's why I say kind of go in the middle is the 650 was great, but because it automatically indexed and it was automatically moving stations, it had a lot of extra parts that were a little bit of a pain to change between calibers. So it would take longer minutes to change the plate and the feeder and the buttons and the all these things out when you wanted to switch. Where the beauty of a single stage is you can just unscrew the die and screw in the other one and you can go from 223 to 30-06 in a couple seconds. It's really easy. Well, if you get something like a Dillon 550, which is what I'm running now, I thought it was going to slow me down a lot because it doesn't do the auto index like the 650 does, but it really doesn't. Um, I don't think it slows me down that much at all. I just have to, after I, you know, uh, lower the handle down. I take my thumb and I have to rotate it and then I put the bullet on. But my left hand is there anyway. So it doesn't slow me down that much. But what I really like is I can let it be my single stage for me too. I just pop in the new die head. Dylan has the interchangeable heads where they're threaded for the dies. I just pop in a blank die head and I screw in my individual die as I need it. And I just use, you know, the left stage, you know, spot for my left hand. I can put it in, crank it in, lower it and pull it back out. I don't have to worry about it chasing it around as it automatically spins or turns on me. I don't have to worry about any of that. So the 550 is a great middle-of-the-line road there, Henry. I mean, you can reload your progressive pistol, not quite as fast as a 650, but still pretty quick. And you can use it as a progressive press without any automatic you know, stations, without any automatic powder, without anything. You can just use it to press up and down. Now, it's not perfect for either. As a single stage, you're going to run into troubles when you're looking for extreme accuracy and you're worried about what's called runout. And runout is essentially the concentricity of the entire cartridge. So to test runout, they put an entire cartridge on a, a device that has some ball bearings. The, the cartridge lays on its side and you can roll the cartridge with your fingers and there's a little gauge that comes down that rests on the bullet. And if the gauge moves, it's because the bullet is a little lopsided as it turns. That's called runout. The problem with things like the Dillon is the base and, and the heads are kind of where they're at. And if they end up being a little bit off or a little bit of slop in the system, it won't self-center it will, you know, itself like a lot of the single stages will. Have I ever had a problem? No. Um, if you're getting into long-range shooting, you've probably heard of the name David Tubb. I, I've never asked him myself, but it's been rumored that he set some world records on a Dillon 550. So he used exactly the system I'm talking about. So... You could have your one reloader for everything, and he reloaded his precision long-range ammo and set world records with it, so it can't be that bad. Now, on a single stage, you would have to reset the die each time you change the caliper, correct? Well, You'd you have to readjust it to the gun and everything. No, you should check it, but there's actually little set rings on the die. 
that you clamp into place. So when you, when you screw the die back in, it stops at that ring. Yeah, you, you should, you should Dillon, confirm it. The Dylan has a block you slide in, and it's it just stays. You never have to mess with it. Correct. So you pull the block out. You set it to the side. They even make little stands for you so it can sit on the stand. And, yeah, I, I want to reload. So I do the way I'm using that 550 is I'll have a couple heads set up for the progressive. So the powder measure's already there. Powder measure's already set up to the right setting. Everything. So I want to load 223. I slap in the 223 head. I take out one Allen bolt to remove the base plate. I put the new base plate in, put the Allen bolt back in. I'm up and running. And I can sit there and crank out a bunch of 223. I want to change the handgun. Same thing. New head. Change the bottom. I'm running the handgun. It's already set up to the right everything. Now, and then when I want to do the rifle, I could just throw in the empty head. I have an extra empty head that's just bare threads. So it makes it like a single stage. Then I can screw in the rifle dies, like my 30 out 6 dies. I have those set rings. Well, I'll talk about in the future, but I finally got a Forster Coax, which is just, to me, the granddaddy of single stage, you know, uh, reloading presses. The thing is awesome. And it's even easier is that it uses the locking ring as a way to hold the die. So the locking ring actually has to move to a new position. But you slide the die in the front of the machine. So it has you know, a, a hole or a path milled the width of the die. And like you said, everything is radius. Well, the back of the hole that's cut or the track that's cut is radius, but it's the same diameter as the die. And then there's another cut raceway in there for the ring that screws into the die. So you just throw the die in and the ring is what keeps it from going high or low or, you know, up or down or falling. There's no screwing it in. And then the base you don't have to change out the base to the different sizes for your brass. It's actually two jaws that come together under spring tension. So as you lift the handle up, the jaws come together and grab your brass, and they just stop wherever your brass is. Well, the beauty of that is, even when it's holding your brass, you can, with your fingers, you can slide your brass side to side, because those jaws are spring-loaded. So it allows it to wiggle a little bit side to side if it needs to. And the die, because of how it went at the raceway, it allows itself to naturally slide front and back the way it needs to. So between the side and side and front and back, you're guaranteed every single time you lift it up, it perfectly centers itself. It's a really slick setup. I'll, I'll, I'll take some pictures later when we get into it talk about it. Uh, with some shortcomings, but I got that just because I figure as I'm writing the more books and I'm doing the more explanations, you might as well have some cool pictures. So I... I mm -hmm. talked myself into buying a, a really, 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 really cool single stage press. So that one's even faster. So as you get into talking about reloading for the long range shooting, are you reloading your rifle ammo to a spec? Are you setting it specific to the rifle? What do you mean to a spec? Like outside dimensions or pressure or all the above? Outside dimensions. So, you know, the... I would imagine in my mind, every gun is going to be a little different where the rifling start and where the bullet sits. You're exactly right, which is why hand loading is so uh, effective. Not only is it nice because you can take more care with the consistency from round to round, which we've talked about over and over. Consistency is the key to accuracy. You, know, you can take your time and spend five minutes getting the powder and the, the depth of the bullet exactly where you want it to be. So not only can you do that, but you can tailor it to your gun. So there are some guns that just shoot some ammo well and not other ammo well. It's not better or worse, it's just different. So you're right, the throats are longer in some guns, the chambers are tighter, the who knows. And so not only can you change the bullet weight easier, you can change the powder, how hot, how fast, how much pressure. You change all these things and you can tailor it in to get a gun. I mean, you take a factory gun and put hand loads in it. Now, proper hand loads that fit it, it's going to be a tack driver versus a custom gun shooting factory ammo. So it's amazing how well you can make a mediocre gun perform just by getting the, the ammo tuned in. And that's, that's going to be multiple podcasts. That, that's almost half of this new advanced long-range shooting book I'm putting together is how to reload and how to ha or hand load this ammo and how to figure out the harmonics of your barrel and how to figure out the velocity and what it needs to be done for yours. So yeah, there's much, much more than we could cover before we're done with this podcast. <laughs> and there's even guys that won't resize their brass back to the Sammy spec. You know, they won't get it back to what's, you know, 30 out six is supposed to be. They'll actually let it stay whatever size it is. Cause that's the size their chamber was. All they'll do is just resize the neck of the brass a little bit. So there's enough tension to hold their bullet. 
you know, so, so they can they know for sure it fits their chamber like a glove. There's even guys that have their barrels custom made that are custom chambered. They'll have dies made at the exact same time. So whoever reamed their chamber into the rifling also just moved right over and reamed a couple dies for them. So they have exact copies of their chamber when they're at home reloading. Um, that's a little more intense than, than I've ever gotten yet. But yeah, so there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of nuances, a lot of tricks there uh, that people can do. So Henry, um, if you want one, get a Dell in 550. I don't think you'll, you'll regret it. And if you do, you'll get your money back out of it. You can put it on eBay. You'll see the things hold their value and do your progressive stages for the handgun and then just do uh, one at a time for the rifle or even try um, putting it through the powder measure. You'll be surprised how accurate that powder measure really can be. You know, you'll be weighing every single one out and getting great accuracy. But once you figure that out, so once you figure out exactly the dimensions, which won't change from your dies, and you figure out the powder, the type and the quantity that work best for you, try it. Take the time to set your automatic powder measure up and just run yourself 10 rounds and mark them somehow. Mix, have a buddy mix them up so you can't tell what the markings are. You take a Sharpie and put different shapes on the primers or something and go out and shoot the groups and tell me if you can see a difference. And if, if you can't, if you get good performance out of it, then I would ask why you're wasting all your time staring at a scale. But anyway, we'll cover that more in the future. Sound good? I have a lawyer question for you. Shoot. So you're buying all these different powders and testing all this different ammo. I've been asked this before, and I, I don't know the answer to it is why I'm asking. How much powder are you legally allowed to have in your household? Uh, not enough. <laughs> so there, I think it's 20, maybe 25. It's one of those two numbers. You caught me off guard. Uh, of powder that you're supposed to be able to have, anything over that is supposed to not be allowed. But I don't think anyone really follows that. Um, now smokeless powder, which is what you're using to reload is much, much safer and has less controls on it than black powder. So if you're using like old muzzle or black powder, that's much more of a problem because black powder technically is more of an explosive where smokeless powder is not, or at least I say technically, cause it's, it's not as dangerous. Um, so yeah, 20 or 25 is what you're supposed to keep it at for residential, you know, dwellings for personal use. But I've never, ever, ever heard of that being enforced or going over. What you need to worry about is your insurance policy. Go read your homeowner's insurance policy, and you might be surprised. It'll say on there that you can't have smokeless powder in the house. And you better check because, heaven forbid, you have a house fire that had nothing to do with the smokeless powder. But somehow they came and investigated after, and they see remnants of a smokeless powder jug, you might lose out on a whole lot of money because of that. So just be careful what you're doing. Also, be very careful how you store it. There used to be regulations that you had to keep the smokeless powder, for example, at the top of the house. And you might think, well, that's where the fire is going to get to it easiest. Well, yeah, it's also what's going to cause the least damage. And as you all know, I hope you all know, the smokeless powder will not explode when it gets on fire. It'll just burn really fast. But up top, at least it's not going to burn up through the house. Um, the other thing is the recommended storage magazines for it are wood cabinets. So the best way to store it is with a one inch thick wood cabinet. That also was counterintuitive to me the first time I heard it. You think you'd want it <laughs> out of metal or something, right? Well, if you make a, a cabinet out of metal and it's full of uh, smokeless powder, you've essentially made yourself a bomb. That when it finally does build pressure and if something fell in front of the cabinet or the door got stuck or something you could build unsafe pressures and blow the thing up and i guess with the wood is one that one inches of wood gives you a lot of insulation from the heat it really does it's going to take a while for the heat to get through the one inch of wood and if it does catch on fire and start to burn through it's also going to take a while to get through the one inch of wood but by the time it gets through the wood that now means by definition you have an opening for the pressure to get out because the fire had to get in so I always thought that was kind of neat. But there's your go to the Home Depot and get one of the you know um, their cabinets they sell. Get one of the one offs for the scratch and dent cabinet, so it's cheap. And buy yourself a extra piece of plywood, and just reinforce the inside of the cabinet with an extra layer of plywood. So to, all together you'd have over an inch, and that'd be a great uh, powder storage cabinet for you. Um, and primers, of course, everyone be careful of primers. Primers are the actual explosive. You know, you'd be careful at those too on you know how they're stored or who you're going to allow access to them or things like that so does that answer your question a little bit yes it does and that was interesting i did not know about the 
home insurance, but it makes sense because who reads all their home insurance stuff anyway? Be careful. Yep. That'd be a shame. So uh, that's the point here. So if you're listening to the podcast, first off, thank you. You need to go tell multiple people, help spread the word. But I also hope you're learning something. So if you knew everything I talked about and all you learned about was that wood cabinet, well then technically you learned something. So be happy. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm trying to keep it basic, but also get extra information out there. Uh, let me give one more tip when I'm thinking about that powder. There are other reasons I like having a cabinet for powder instead of just having it on a shelf is you never, ever want to mix up your powders. Sometimes it just might be bad accuracy. It might just be a weird noise. Um, but if you put, for example, any handgun powder in a rifle cartridge, you know, not 300 blackout or something, but like a bigger rifle cartridge, you're very likely going to blow your gun up, not make it break. I mean, blow it up into multiple small pieces. You know, if you, if you put a uh, nine mil powder in a 30 out six for, for some reason. You, know, you, you are going to have a bad day and maybe a trip to the emergency room. So when you're dealing with different powder measures that are, are going to still have powder left in them, because you're supposed to dump it out each time, but I don't. I know you're not going to either. And before you get another, like a freestanding powder measure, and before you start getting out your scales and stuff like that, you need to discipline yourself to only having one powder out at a time. So with the cabinet, it's nice. So whatever I'm reloading or working with and the powder measure is full of powder, I leave that jug of powder on the counter. And you always, when you come back to reloading the next night, stop and look at that jug and triple check that that's the actual powder you want to be loading on this cartridge, you know, or else bad things will happen. So, all right, guys, uh, we covered a bunch of those questions. Sorry we took so long on that. I hope you learned something. Jason, go get those, go get that lower. I want to see pictures of it. I want to be able to find out about the company. It sounds like they're getting you a good deal. And uh, we need to get to building the lower next, next week. What do you say? Sounds great. And I will try to get some pictures if I can of some of the things we talked about, like the EDM, um, and just see what he'll let me, let me do while I'm there. Oh yeah. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool. Um, to be able to share what's going on and especially see if he, uh, we, we need to, we need to hook up our, our listeners, see if they want to build along with you. That'd be kind of cool. If you guys are interested, you know, do it right alongside of Jason and, and, uh, see who can get a more accurate gun when we're done. So. All right, man. Good deal. Thanks for uh, calling in, Jason. Everybody else, thanks for listening. Again, please spread the word. I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Take care, guys.